the end of the day. But uh, anyway, we've always been there in June. We've never been there in the, in the winter months. Hey, Hi everybody, Stu, AG6AG. This is a talk on FT8 that I gave in August of 2020 to the Ventura County Amateur Radio Club. This talk covers some slides of basic stuff of the history of FT8 and basic configuration settings that you'll make when you initially install the program. After we get past that, we actually go into some live contact demo. Um, beyond that, it's mostly questions and answers. Uh, I kept the questions and answers in because I thought they really added to the content. Anyway, hey, if you like what you're seeing in our channel, don't forget to subscribe and like the videos. Anyway, with that, let's go ahead and join me in August. All right. So, let's see here. Ah, JT65, FT8, FT4, etc., etc., etc. For those of you that don't know, I'm Stu, AG6, AG. Uh, and uh, been an amateur radio operator for a little over five years. It seems like much longer than that, but uh, yeah, for a little over five years. Um, the uh, Let's see. Let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about what JT65, FT8, FT4, and all that is all about. Uh, basically, what we are looking at here is... Uh, the history of extremely weak signal protocols. Um, these protocols were designed to do moon bounce, uh, play around a little with meteor shower, but the concept was that people used to do uh, moon bounce using CW. Somebody got the bright idea that, you know, if we digitize this and turn it into something with air correction and send it for a really, really long time, somebody on the other side might be able to decode it and answer it. And with the uh, early moon bounces, uh, we, it used to be a timed protocol anyway. You'd be on one, you'd be transmitting on the even and somebody else would be transmitting on the odd minute. So they stole that from uh, extremely weak signal. Um, that said, there are a few different protocols, but the ones that we kind of all talk about basically are JT65. Uh, JC65 takes a minute per uh, transmit. So in order to get a complete exchange in, you're usually looking about six minutes to complete a QSO. Um, JT65 can decode signals many dB below the, uh, below the noise floor, which is kind of cool when you think about it. I mean, you know, you're decoding things that uh, you can't pick up normally. Uh, signals are encoded and then compressed and then packed uh, package for error correction. So <clears throat> every, uh, every signal that it sends is put into a single error correction package and it sends tons of those signals over those packets over and over and over again for that minute. So they can be basically opened up, <clears throat> checksummed, and assembled together if they get bits and pieces. It uses uh, multi-frequency shift keying with 65 tones at four hertz width, which is, wow, you know, very cool. Takes a little horsepower to run on your computer. Well, everybody said it was taking too long, so they came up with FT8, uh, which is four times faster than JT65, uh, with roughly the same sensitivity. Now, I, I stole that off the website. I would argue it does not have the same sensitivity because you're not getting the repetition over time that you get with JT65. Uh, it uses uh, Gaussian uh, frequency or uh, uh, Gaussian frequency shift gain. And uh, I don't know a lot about Gaussian, so I encourage you to go look it up, but it's just one more algorithm to learn. Um, 15 seconds per transmission each way, right? So you send for uh, basically uh, 12 and a half seconds, two and a half seconds to decode, 
they send back for 12 and a half seconds, two and a half seconds to decode. Um, the, uh, uh, and then FT4, man, that's twice as fast, seven and a half seconds per transmission. Um, I played with FT4 a few times. Eh, you know, like I said, the faster it is, the less people I'm able to get QSOs with. So uh, I pretty much hover around FT8. Um, now, there's not a lot of software packages out there. Uh, you've got WSJTX, which is the father of them all. Uh, you've got JTDX, which is a fork of WSJTX. Uh, a little bit of a different uh, user interface, but all the code underneath is still WSJTX. GT Alert, which is a graphical overlay for WSJTX. It basically overlays the top of it with uh, what, what looks to be a, a map and allows you to select, as I understand it, the uh, different calls that are out there. So if you're uh, seeing they're calling or listening to uh, people call CQ, it's going to populate in a map rather than a list. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the latest thing, J, uh, JS8 call, which is a strange new use of FT8. Uh, a lot of people right now ask me about JS8 call. And JS8 call is cool from the standpoint that you can actually send uh, messages back and forth. You can have a theoretical rag chew, but um, the reality of it is that, uh, you know, uh, to send out like a sentence takes a minute to a minute and a half of you transmitting uh, five or six different transmit sequences at, uh, oh, uh, uh, 15 seconds each. So it can, it can get a little bit, well, uh, long-winded. So I don't really like it as much as I like doing FT8. But again, you know, give it a shot. Uh, are there any others out there? Um, yes, there are, but I don't know enough about them to comment on them. Um, and some are pay for play. The ones I've mentioned here are all free. So, well, free as in free beer. Other than uh, WSJTX, which is actually open source, and you can download the code and build it on any platform you want. Anyway, the most important part of using these protocols is time synchronization. It is completely depend dependent on time. If your time is more than a, oh gosh, I'm going to say, ah. Uh, less than a half a second off, you're going to not be able to decode and people aren't going to be able to decode you. So you have to spend special attention to making sure that you have proper time synchronization on your computer. Windows 10 has built in internet time synchronization, but the reality of it is it's not very good. Um, it will not uh, synchronize the time unless you're two seconds off before to make a major synchronization. And that's just too far off. My recommendation is to find the uh, uh, NTP build, the actual NTP software build uh, from uh, uh, that's open source that's on, that's the base for all the time servers that are out there on the internet. Uh, there is a company that does um, Oh, uh, does compile that for Windows 10 with a nice little daemon and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, I will get that information and put it in the, uh, the notes uh, on the video when we go ahead and post it so you can download that. Um, anyway, but then again, you're running on a computer. So what kind of horsepower do we need? Well, uh, my computer that I'm on right now is, uh, it's uh, got six processors with hyperthreading and 32 gig of RAM. It runs Windows 10 um, and uh, it's got a, uh, a high-end video card in it. Now, do I need all that to do this? No, not just to run, um, uh, not just to run WS -J, uh, -J, uh, JTX. I don't, okay. But I do need it if I'm going to do videos, record, play with other stuff, do other stuff in the background while I'm doing JT, uh, uh, excuse me, while I'm doing uh, FT8. If I don't 
have that kind of horsepower, it's going to lag and that's bad. I need it to decode as quickly as possible in order to get that QSO that I'm looking for. Um, so I'm sure you didn't come here to listen to me talk about what kind of PC you need and everything else, um, you know, uh, and uh, just to finish that conversation though, uh, you can get away with, uh, you know, a Core 2 Duo with uh, 8 gig of RAM uh, on a Windows 10 machine and have no problems running uh, WSJTX. Um, so with that, for those of you that aren't using WSJTX at all or uh, are just getting started with it and haven't really played with it much and you're still messing around with the uh, configuration settings, I thought I'd really quickly go over some of the key settings that I use and why I use them. Um, basically, once you do an install and you launch WSJTX, this is going to be the screen that comes up. You go under File and go to Settings. And here you are, here are your master settings. This is uh, a virgin install for version 2.2.2. So there's nothing in here. Uh, this is how it comes up. And uh, when I fill mine out, of course, I put my call sign in, my grid square. Um, and uh, I check that I want a blank line between decoding periods when we do Stu, the live. I'm sorry? Stu, this is Pedro. A quick question. Um, are we going to have this recording available? Yes, it'll be up on YouTube. Okay, thank you very much. I'll no problem at all. Myself again. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't have to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so uh, you notice that I have that checked. And what that does is that puts a line between the transmission times, right? So I can distinguish, okay, when I look back up to this line, that is how uh, who's just transmitted in that time cycle. And you'll see that when we get to the live demo and how that works. Uh, sorry, you know, this is America and I went to school here in America and I, I, I got to have distance in miles. I just, I can't do it in kilometers. My brain isn't fast enough. Um, and uh, TX messages to RX frequency, uh, that is one of the defaults, but I want to make sure I leave that set. I want to show DXCC or DX uh, Century Club grid and worked before status when I'm seeing the uh, uh, the calls come in, right? So I want to have that color coded and I want to know which one is which. Uh, when I move down to behavior, of course, I, if I double click on a call, I want that to set to transmit enable. You'll see that in action when we go live. Um, as far as uh, I like to disable my transmit after I send a, uh, after sending a 73, uh, that means that I can get a sense of what's going on. That's really more important um, when you're calling CW um, because, or excuse me, when you're not calling CW, when you're doing search and pounce, uh, because you don't want to continue to transmit. You don't want to start transmitting CW uh, on, or CQ on somebody's frequency, uh, you know, that you've just done a QSO with them. So you want that to go ahead and shut off. Um, and I actually allow TX frequency changes while transmitting. And that's just in case uh, I, I end up realizing that I'm transmitting someplace that I really, I don't want to transmit because of quality, but we can go into that a little bit further. Um, once we get done with that, we want to go to our radio tab. And this is where we're going to set up our cat or our computer aided uh, uh, transmitting. Now, by default, this is it. It's just basically set to none with VOX. I open up the pull down. I've got a Yesu FTDX3000. So I select that. And I talk a lot in my videos about baud rate and serial ports and uh, data bits and stop bits and handshakes, DTR, RTS, all that stuff. If you are having trouble getting CAT to work with your radio, you should watch some of the videos that I have that uh, talk about CAT. Uh, uh, Zach just said I don't have a slide up. Is that correct? Not correct. I can see it. Okay. All right. All right. 
anyway, and you notice that I've switched this to cat as well, and I've tested my cat. So that seems to work fine. Uh, let's see. Uh, once we get this set up, and when I got cat displaying green, of course, I can do a test P uh, push to talk to verify that works as well. Uh, I got to move to audio. So all of these protocols are AFSK or audio frequency shift keen. Okay. Uh, and the way that we do that is we need to set our input and our output sound device. If you have a signal length or whatever, you know, uh, this is fairly simple. It's a USB uh, sound card. My USB, uh, I plug a USB cable in the back of my rig and it has built in sound card emulation. So for me, it's just another USB sound card that I'm going to have to select uh, from my pull downs, right? Um, you notice I got a bunch of USB sound cards in here. That's because I do a lot of recording and other stuff with this particular computer, as well as have a couple different rigs plugged into it. So uh, I got a lot of, uh, a lot of competing stuff. Uh, it's important that you know what devices are which and go to which equipment. Um, and that's just, you know, when you plug it in, you look at what changed in the device manager. Uh, we talk about that in some other videos. So if you go to my website, uh, or actually if you go to my YouTube page, uh, you'll be able to find information on that stuff as well. Um, basically, once I've selected that, pretty much everything in my particular case is the same. Uh, let's see. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, let's see. From there, um, reporting. This is the default reporting page. Network services. A lot of people ask me questions. Network services allows the, uh, the program WSJTX to communicate via UDP ports with the other programs. A great example is I have WSJTX talk to my log for old man program and it sends over the completed QSOs when I'm done and synchronizes frequencies and things like that. So it uh, works very effectively. Um, there's a secondary UTP server that has been depreciated, but some of the older programs that interface with it use it, or you can use it as a separate channel rather than trying to daisy chain a, stuff, a bunch of stuff together via UTP sockets. Um, more information on that, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, that's something you're going to have to read up on the WSJTX site or your logging software site or whatever software you're trying to interface with uh, WSJTX. Um, as far as what I change on this, uh, I want it to prompt me to uh, log the QSO, so I check that box up at the top there on logging. And then uh, I make sure clear, uh, clear DX call and grid after logging so that all goes away. The rest of it I don't usually mess with. I'm not going to mess with frequencies. Uh, those are pre-programmed frequencies. I'm going to jump directly to color. Color is how calls are highlighted when you receive them. And it's typically associated with CQ calls. So it has a reasonably okay setting uh, that uh, has all CQs green and some of the really cool CQs a different color. I changed that a little bit. Uh, it has a bunch of stuff that isn't checked as well. I just go crazy. I check everything and I uncheck CQ in message, uh, the green one down there, second from the bottom. Now, why do I do that? Well, what you'll see when we go into the demo is you're going to see how all the CQs have colors except for the ones that I've already talked to. They have a white background, okay? Uh, with a white background, I don't bother checking it because I don't want to make a second QSO with somebody I have already talked with because it really doesn't give me any benefit. Um, you know, although, you know, you certainly can, if I see somebody that I know or something like that, I certainly can do a second QSO with them, but it's kind of like in a contest. You really don't want to, uh, uh, have that, uh, second QSO with somebody because you don't get credit for anything. And when I talk about credit, I need to be careful, understand that, 
Uh, we're not here doing contests, but most folks use this to get awards. They want to get worked all state. They want to get their DX uh, Century Club uh, award, or they want to get worked all continents or something like that. Um, uh, you know, worked all Europe, worked all of Europe. Um, and this uh, color coding and everything else helps you do that and not interfere with people doing the same thing, giving them two QSOs in the same area to the same person. Anyway, so that's what I do. That's the only thing I change. The one thing I'll mention is there's a little box uh, just below the reset highlighting big bar. There's a box there that says rescan ADIF log. If you make changes in here, you're going to want to click to rescan that log. If you do an import into the uh, ADIF file on uh, uh, WSJTX, you're going to want to rescan the log because when you rescan the log, that uh, gives it all the information to put on that uh, particular call when it comes up again. Anyway, so with that, let's take a quick look at advanced. This is how advanced launches. And this is pretty much the way I leave it. I don't change this one at all. I leave it exactly the way it is. Uh, if I'm operating a contest or something, of course, I've got that bottom box there, special operating activities. This is how I can set up to do, uh, oh, uh, de-exposition, uh, expeditions. I can set up to uh, do contests and all sorts of other things. But for normal daily operation, I'm pretty much not going to mess with that. And I'm certainly not going to uh, really mess with the random erasure patterns and the rest of the stuff. The default settings on this are pretty good. With that, now we've got, we get to this beautiful thing called the waterfall. And the one up at the top is the, the way it launches the way it's configured when you first install it. And to me, that's a bit useless uh, because everything's all scrunched together, you know? Uh, so I like to spread things out. I like it a little faster. I like it a little easier to read. Um, so the first thing I do is uh, if you look down on the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, gray section there, you'll see it says uh, bins pixels two. I leave that alone, but if I change that to one, what that is, is it's the multiplier for how much data it puts in that graph. So a great example is if I have it set to bin pixel two and I have it out at uh, oh, uh, 1980 uh, uh, dots per inch or whatever, right, DPI on the monitor, it gets all of the band, okay? If I shrink it to half, I need to change that to bit pixels four to squeeze the entire band into whatever my width is of my graph. Um, start at zero hertz, that's the default. You notice though that I changed the N average from five to one. And what that does is it basically stretches things out a bit and gives us more area to look at something, speeds it up a bit too. Um, I basically also turn off the flattening and I change from cumulative to current. Then all I have to do at that point is adjust out the way I uh, want the uh, uh, waterfall to behave as far as uh, color and contrast, right? How hot do I want it? Do I want big red things up there or do I want yellow to red? How do I want to see those things? And you'll see the way I have it set up on my machine. Um, and matter of fact, uh, pretty soon. Uh, and also, uh, I want to adjust out my um, um, oh, uh, scope to make sure that I'm, you know, seeing the things I want to see. Now, I'm going to let you in on a secret, though. When you're operating, you're not going to be using this much. It's a great way to find an open space to see if uh, everything's open. But, um, you know, you're not going to be using it to find somebody to talk to. You're going to be looking at that left box in the master part of the program. And uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and see if we can get this set up to run. And I'm going to try to do a live demo. Silly me. 
So let me go ahead and bail out of this window. So everybody see that? Looks good, Stu. All right, thank here. you. All right, give me a second here. Okay, so what I want to do here is I'm going to hit tune and I'm going to adjust my ACL meter over here so it shows nothing. Then I can set my power and that way I'm going to get the cleanest audio signal. Okay. Another thing, I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. Okay. Under configuration, under radio, I check split operation rig. So let me explain what that does. If your rig supports split operation, what it does is it changes, uh, it changes the frequency that you are transmitting on, okay? Let me explain that a little bit. According to the write-up that everybody does and the programmers, they say that the best audio quality uh, that you can generate for receive the cleanest signal, <coughs> excuse me, that you can generate from the sound cards is between 1500 and 2000 hertz, okay? So what this does is it actually shifts the transmission. If you're down here, okay? And by the way, let me clean up my frequency here. I want to be on 14040. Uh, but if you see down here, you notice up here, see this red uh, bracket? That's where I would transmit, okay? If you look, I am on my uh, second VFO. I'm on 14.073, uh, not 7.4. So because I am 1,000 hertz below that ideal area, it changes where I transmit in order to put it into uh, a better mode. So if I go over here, let's say, and right hand mouse click and set my transmission, look what it does to the second VFO, right? It's changing it back because this is the auto area it wants to be in, all right? Now, I don't recommend you do this out of the gate, okay? Because it can get confusing. But uh, remember that it's there and play with it and see if it's something that actually benefits you. The other thing that I will mention from a technical standpoint on this is that as you work more and more um, transmitting your uh, your transmitter is going to heat up. Your finals are going to get a little warmer. Everything's going to fluctuate a bit as far as your power output. So you want to keep an eye on what kind of power you're putting out. You may start at 20, uh, 20 watts, but you may turn around and look and all of a sudden you're down to 15 and you reach over and you turn your uh, uh, audio gain up and it shoots right back up without going into the ALC. So be aware, this is not just kind of a, I'm going to run it and forget about it. You got to kind of keep your eye on it. And we talked a little bit about the controls, right? And you see on this, I've got my average set here to one. If I start moving this average up, okay, everything slows down. So I start getting less and less there. So I'm going to bring that back. I like it on one. I don't like it uh, flattened. Uh, and I like my, uh, uh, this is the percentage that the spectrum analyzer is going to use of the screen. I like it at 30, the faults at uh, 20. Uh, it just makes it smaller, right? I like to get it up at about 30. It makes it easier for me to see. All right. So what we have and our main controls is uh, we've got the left window, which is everything that's being received and decoded. And the right window is what my audio listen is on. 
okay, up here, the green bracket. Also, this is where anybody on any place on the frequency is going to appear if they're transmitting my call sign, okay? Uh, and also, if I'm transmitting anything, this is the window over here on the right that's going to show me transmitting, all right? A um, couple things of note, you can adjust your power output here to make it weaker or stronger. I choose to do that on a volume dial, basically. For me, it's what we call the data uh, audio volume on the radio, but if it was a, a signal link, I could just turn the transmit volume to adjust it to get rid of that ALC, right? Because I don't want any ALC. I'd rather have lower audio uh, power and turn up the radio's transmitter power uh, to get to the wattage that I'm looking to put out, all right? All right, so there's a little cool little box over here right on the left called CQ only. We're going to check that. What's going to happen is it now is only going to decode CQs. That's all I'm going to see over here in the left box. And you see that? Remember I talked about that blank line? See that line right there that says 20M, right, with all the dots? That's kind of gray. See how it keeps adding those? Those are the time slices. So this is the absolutely the last time slice, okay? When it comes again, we'll see another line underneath this KGM, see right there? And all right, so before I, uh, before I start seriously playing, let me erase this out. I hit erase twice and if I hit F4, it's gonna clear my DX call and my DX grid. Any questions before I try to make a cue up? All right. So let's see what we got. Uh, I like him. He's nice and strong. He's eight on the meter here. Let's get rid of that beep. It drives me crazy. Now you notice over on this side, I'm transmitting to him, telling him my grid square. Let's see if he heard me. He heard me, he's responding back in red, right? That's him. This is me responding to him. about 1,300 miles. We're getting some good propagation tonight. It's kind of nice. All right, I'm gonna send him a 73. Pops up, ask me if I wanna save it, right? I'm gonna go ahead and save it. It's going to log it into WSJTX. Now, what's going to happen in the background is it's going to log that onto uh, Log for Old Men for me and automatically put it in there. And then it's going to upload it to all my online services. But uh, that's another talk. Um, now, I wait to see, yeah, I wait to make sure I get a response from him that he heard me say 73. Technically, the QSO isn't over until he responds that he got my 73, that he he's received everything. Uh, you gotta be careful of that. <clears throat> as far as calling CQ, you would uncheck the CQ only, but it really doesn't matter. And I would look up here and try to find a spot that doesn't look like there's a lot of people transmitting locally. And this one over here looks pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and set my transmit there. I'm going to click here. It says hold TX frequency. That way I know that when I call, when somebody answers, it doesn't pull me off frequency. I'm going to hold that frequency. My TX frequency is not going to change. I'm going to hit CQ. I'll go ahead and enable TX. On the next pass right here, it's going to be odd. So I'm now calling CQ. And again, the whole time I'm watching my ACL, I've got an external watt meter, so I'm watching that. Um, 
So it isn't really just, you know, a lot of people joke around, oh, there's nothing to do. You know, you just uh, you, you launch this thing, go grab a sandwich, come back and log your queues out. Um, you really got to kind of keep an eye on everything to make sure that it's, uh, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And I doubt very seriously uh, just coming out the gate I'm going to get an answer. And but we'll see. And it looks like somebody else is on the frequency as well. So I'm probably ticking them up. Uh, I'll see if I get a response. If I don't, I'll halt and we can talk a little bit. Well, now that was the end of the formal presentation. Uh, if you'd like to continue and watch the question and answer period, I encourage you to do it. There were some great things that they brought up in that question and answer session and some stuff that I even didn't know. So you may enjoy it. Anyway, if you want to leave now, so be it. Thanks for stopping by and don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Any questions or comments, make them down in the comment window below. All right, so any questions, comments, tomatoes, come get me. Oops. Stu, oh, go ahead. Who was up? Hey, I just had a statement. Stu, can you pull up PSK Reporter and show people what else you can do with that? PSK? I don't have PSK Reporter. Really? Well, it's just a website, so let me show oh, you. Oh, sure. I can pull up a website. Okay. Just that I have the technology to do. Okay, I can't share my screen, so I'll let you do it. Uh, just go to PSK Reporter. Let me see. Uh, PSKReporter.info. All right. And then put in your call sign. And then share I've your... I've used this before. I have. And I, I have to say that I do use FT8 pretty much, bl not blindly, but... Uh, uh, I look at my watt meter and I fiddle with the RF gain to try and get the uh, audio not to be saturated. Right. But so this shows your signal in the last 12 hours. So in the upper right, if you click over the last 12 hours and drop down and do the pull down, you can do it down to like 24 hours or 15 minutes. So go to 15 minutes and you'll see your last transmission. All right. Let's see. 15 minutes. Go. And then hit the plus button and zoom in. Um, and so you can see where your, your signal traveled. So you can kind of watch propagation. Oh, wow. You okay. Can, you can ho hover over this. Uh, let's do one other thing. Yeah. Let's go to, let's see, go to display options to the right of the go button at the top. Uh, display options to the right of the go button. Okay. Yep. And then uh, click the button that says, Oh my gosh, I wish I had my glasses on. Um, <laughs> show SNR. Show SNR. Signal noise uh, ratio. Okay. Now hit the X. All right. And so now, maybe that wasn't it. Um, hit go again. Yeah, so now, okay. now, now not only do you see who's hearing you. Oh, wow. Okay. You can see what the... Uh, magnitude of your signal was for them. And the cool thing about this is because everyone's running WSJTX, the fact that they're decoding all this stuff and they're not in active conversation with you, right. WSJTX has taken the entire receive window, decoding all those things and saying, you heard this, you heard that. So you're contributing to this database also. Wow. So it's pretty cool. Um, so, and then this color is, for 20 meters. And if you transmit 40 meters, it'll be dark blue. And if you transmit, you know, 30, it's green. Right, right, right. So this is a really handy way to see where you're going. So I use this to find out like, well, 30 is not working. Let me try 20 and see where right. I can go. It's pretty cool. That's all. Neat. That's neat. Thank you for sharing that. That's very cool. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Bert. Um, what is the display just below the waterfall, the green squiggly line. What, what does that represent? Well, that's basically, uh, so the water, you have the waterfall and then you have the, uh, uh, the, 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 the um, it's basically green squiggly line. a squiggly line. So what that actually represents is you can see the high points where the transmissions are. It represents the DB gain 
coming in on the audio, right? So to, it, the concept is you have a waterfall that's showing you um, in different colors, right? The intensity of the signal. And then you have the same thing in a, gosh, what's it called? It's a, they call it a scope display, but it's Trump. theoretically like you're looking at a oscilloscope display of the audio frequency. One of the things I found the waterfall useful for when you're trying to figure out what band you want to work is, is you can quickly go through a series of bands and just by looking at the waterfall, you get a, a quick and dirty idea of how many people are out there. No, if that's you got, absolutely if you got an empty waterfall, true. don't waste your time. But once you're, once you're operating, that waterfall has very little, to, very little to give you at that point, because now everything is in that main control window. Yeah, the only thing the waterfall that I found useful when I'm operating is if I want to send CQs, like you were saying before, you just put yourself in a place where nobody else is. So I'll and, tell you another really good use out. for it. All right, um, and this is this is uh, this is an old this is an old family secret, right? So maybe I have to kill you if I tell you. But no. Um, you can look at the waterfall. Have you ever been working and there's some guy that comes on, you know, he's just down the street or he's got a Yagi and he's pointing it down at your house. And all of a sudden you've got this giant noise that's coming down the waterfall that just wipes everybody else that you're trying to listen to. That ever, that never happens, right? <laughs> well, so what I do is I, I've got the ability to adjust the size of my notch filter in the menu of the 3000. It has two sizes. It has a normal and then it has a narrow. I set that notch to narrow. Then I can turn the notch filter on and slide it right over the top on that waterfall. And amazingly with that notch filter, I drop his DB so far, all of a sudden all the rest of the stations come back in. So it's a really quick and easy way to figure out where you want to position that notch filter. That's another great use for the waterfall. Well, how about, so there's one frequency in each band? There's, or how's a, how's a frequency allocation work for all these things? Well, right now, uh, there, if, uh, if you're working on 20 meters, you're on 14.070, or excuse me, 14074. If you're working on uh, 40 meters, it's 7074. Uh, so it's basically 074. I think the only variation on that is 50 meters, isn't it, Keith? I'm trying to remember. It's, it's different on the work bands, but on the standard bands, the 074 is going to be FT8. Okay. And, and to finish on that, every one of those signals, every one of those different people, they're all on the same radio frequency. They're creating a different musical note that their data is being transmitted on. And I think it's a pretty handy trick when you're setting this up to go ahead and put it through your speakers and listen to it. <laughs> and you start to realize there that it's actually these nine notes are being played at the same time and that's nine different guys on the band. Yeah. 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 So that really everything's being done in audio, not RF. And it, it really did take me a couple of weeks of banging my head against my desk until I went, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's really easy to manipulate things to your favor. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of other tricks that you pick up, right? You can, if you're getting a lot of distortion on your receive, you can turn around and uh, turn your AF uh, down rather than, you know, or your RF, uh, AF, RF, uh, RF, you can turn the RF down and it'll bring right, down the distortion. One more thing about that, Stu. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that I've noticed in my neighborhood here that rely on their ALC to set their final output volume. And the way ALC works in most radios is it's going to create audio overtones, which is why you get kind of a Cylon sort of robot voice when you rely on it too much when speaking. That can blow out the entire audio spectrum of everybody in the neighborhood using FT8. So when you do this, make sure you set the level so that your ALC is not working. It's that you fill it, but you don't over, overfill it. And that's more, much more of a way to cause interference than too much power is. And Stu and I have had some fun laughing at a few people here in my neighborhood that would literally blow out the entire spectrum. 
And I finally figured out it's why. It's not because they have 8,000 watts. It's because they're not using their ALC properly. It's also hard to decode. I mean, your output, your output power and your output audio is really, really an, an important part of this. Because if, it's, if, if they can't decode you, you're never going to get a QSO. You know, you, there's all sorts of little tricks you can do to try to make it easier to hear the guy you're trying to have that QSO with. But, you know, the same thing. If, if you're doing it on phone and your microphone is just totally distorting. Yeah, there's a good picture of total distortion right there. Yeah, that, was, that was one guy did that. I talked to him eventually. He only has a 100-watt radio. But he had the volume on his computer turned up all the way. So that's what his radio did with the ALC. It 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 took everybody out of FT8 that day. <laughs> what limits the uh, so so as a pra as a practical matter, what are the things you can play with to adjust that ACL level? Well, you, there's two different you... things. You can you can turn down the um, obviously turn down the uh, data volume, but the the biggest thing is if you're using an external sound device is go over to that uh, on that external sound device or on the computer turn down the audio volume that you're putting into the radio also on uh let me uh on the on the program is that the slider that's on yeah the right? i'm, I'm the, popping the one that says now. the one that says power is that the slider on the right yeah yeah let me, pop, that up let me and pop it up let me pop it up so right here the power slider now this is this is a picture of how it comes out of the gate but yeah right now it's all the way up but you can crank that down now i tend since i'm staring at my radio i tend to use the data volume um you know i've got like a mic gain which turns into a data gain and basically what it is it's an adjustment for the audio output like I'm adjusting the volume going into the sound card. That makes sense? So that's, that's kind of how that works. Uh, over here, I actually have to change this on the sound card settings either in the radio or in the sound card settings on the computer. And I didn't really mention this side. You want it between 40 and 60. 60 is probably as hot as you want it. And that is the audio input that you're getting. If it's in the green, you're in good shape. Okay, so the other variable you can play with is RF power. Does that bear into this at all? Or are you doing it all with micro, my, uh, excuse me, microphone gain and the oh, slider? So let's say that I want to put out 50 watts, okay? And so I'm going to put a tone or something or start transmitting and I am going to turn my audio gain down to where I don't have any ALC, okay? Then if I'm under 50 watts, I am going to turn my power output up to meet 50 watts, okay? But it's two pieces of the same puzzle. So in other words, if you turn up your RF gain, you're also going to increase your ALC? No. No. The ALC is dependent on the audio volume going into the radio. The RF uh, power adjustment is strictly the uh, power that the uh, finals are generating. Okay, so how are you deciding what RF power you want to use, or is it an arbitrary thing? Well, it's an arbitrary thing, whatever you want to use. So uh, how do you decide... How, how do you decide how good your finals are? You know, I mean, you, you're probably not going to want to run 100 watts at 100% power, okay, for a period of time. Yeah, David. I was going to say you can use that PSK reporter and see how far your signal's getting. Good point. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing I'll do is if I, if I call CQ or I answer some guy, part of the message that's going back is besides your call letters is the received strength. Right. So if I find out I'm slamming the guy, I'll go reach over to my ICOM 7300. I'll turn the RF way down. Right. Right. Uh, Clem, 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 I thought you had a question and somebody walked on you. Yeah, I'm used to it. Uh, on mine, <laughs> on mine, uh, yeah, 
I've got a little box here that uh, it's a Yesu thing. And it's got a little receive, little transmit thing on it. And when I, on the on the software, I just crank up the power as high as it'll go. And then on the little box, it's sort of a external PC card, I think. I crank up the TX uh, and there's a meter on the rig itself that, that for the ALC. And when it's transmitting, I, I just come up and uh, on the transmit power and tell, I, I forbid the ALC. At the point the ACL kicks in, I go no further. I, I back it off. But yeah. at that point, the forward power is looking to be like 90 watts, so I kind of turn it down a little bit. Uh, yeah. But I don't know what's nominal output power. In other words, you can push 100. I can put it on the linear. You know, I don't know what's, what's Well, and that's a really good question. And I think the, the best answer we got on that was from Dave, believe it or not. You know, if you're trying to talk to uh, Russia, and no one in Russia is hearing you under over minus 20 dB, you might want to turn up your power, you know? But it's more the issue of, it's supposed to be a low power pro, uh, uh, mode, okay? All digital, quote unquote, is supposed to be low power. Now, I'll tell you, I know the guys that work the RIDI contest, and there are guys out there that are running RIDI at 1500 watts, okay? You know, uh, oh, and uh, what's what's low power? Some people call it five watts. You know, some people call I'd call fifty right. watts low power. When when I was running JT sixty five, the rule of thumb was twenty or lower. Okay, for JT sixty five. Now, also, you got to kind of understand that we had a little bit better propagation when I first was running JT sixty five. Propagation isn't exactly great right now. You know. And I don't think I have ran under 50 watts in a while on FT8, let alone any of the other digital. But, you know, again, everybody says, well, how much power should I run? Uh, and the answer is, you know, the same one that we have with the FCC, enough power to be able to talk to who you're trying to talk to. Um, and the reality of it is that um, do we know how much power we can put out? Well, Back when I used to ride a motorcycle and they said, how fast will your motorcycle go? And I say, I don't know. I haven't gone fast enough to fall off it yet. You know, because that's pretty much as fast as you can go on a motorcycle is when you come off the bike. <laughs> yes, Keith. I melted my first HF rig earlier this year. <laughs> <laughs> Running at, uh, uh, you know, 100%. Um, and as it turns out, the uh, output transistors were fairly affordable, and it only took about a bazillion hours to replace them. <laughs> so you can run 100% all the time. And with our conditions right now, this morning I got a QSO in Kenya, and I was up to 100 watts output to get a minus 22 report from the guy. Because conditions suck right now but I, I tend to start at about 50 watts and I only turn it up if I really think that there's a reason he should be hearing me and he's not. You know, the reason that I have an external antenna tuner is I've blown finals up, okay? I think, I, I don't know. I think if you've been in the hobby long enough, you've smoked a radio. Uh, you probably didn't have the intention, uh, but you probably smoked a radio. It's part of what we do, sadly. Um, and we learn, we learn our lessons, sort of, and we go back. We might do it again, you know. It, it depends. Was that QSO worth the cost of those points, you know? That's, that's a valid question. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Certainly. Okay. Um, the, on the, uh, the little uh, bracket, the, the red and the green bracket, you know, you right-click and you change the frequency where you want it to set at, right? Right. Uh, What's the difference? I don't get it. Why? Why would I want to split? Why would I want? Why wouldn't I just want to keep them on top of each other? Well, that's a really good question. So a lot of times, if you're calling, uh, let's say that it's just it's a mess out there, uh, and you've got a guy that's out there that's calling CQ, and he's a what we'll call a high interest contact. Okay. Uh, maybe he's, uh, you know, uh, someplace in Tasmania or something, right? Uh, and you really want to talk to this guy, but there's also a 
oh, another 2,000 people that really want to talk to this guy. So there is an advantage to listen to his audio signal and then transmit yours on a different audio frequency. The reason being is it doesn't matter where he's listening. If he's on frequency and you're transmitting over here and his call signs in that transmission, the protocol says that it needs to be displayed to him in a color that he can recognize that he is, that someone is trying to get a hold of him, regardless of what audio frequency you're on. There's lots of arguments, though, that if you're just doing regular QSOs, you don't let it follow it. Uh, it all depends on what you're doing at the time. Uh, there have been times that, for sure, I've done different frequencies. Absolutely. I've locked down on an uh, area of uh, the, uh, the spectrum, someplace around 1,200 to 1,500, where nobody was sitting, and that was my transmit frequency. And then my receive audio was all over the place, depending on where they were. Clear as, that was clear as mud. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, you know, it's kind of like, you'll know when you want to do it because it'll make sense to you. It's kind of like running split, the same idea. You know, if uh, you've got somebody that uh, you've got a de-expedition out there that's calling a bunch of frequency, calling a button, calling CQ and a bunch of people are piling on him, you may want to come off that frequency. That's an old trick too, you know? If there's a guy that is just getting like a giant pile up, I'll go through, you know, 3K up and I'll start calling CQ in the hope that when they spin the dial up to find the next contact, they hit me. Right. But that's, you know, same sort of idea. If somebody else had something? Wow. You made it through the questions and answers. That's great. And I want to thank you for uh, checking out this video and, being a part of our little online group. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe and check the like button. Also, if you have any comments or questions, make them down in the comments down below. Thanks again. This is Stu, AG6AG, saying 73, and hope to hear you on the air.